Hello, I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Health Humanities and Ethics at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Welcome to Medical Center Hour, UVA's public forum on medicine, healthcare, and society. Thank you for joining us today. Our schedule of weekly Zoom webinars is posted on the website through our Center for Health Humanities and Ethics. Do come to Medical Center Hour every Wednesday. Our Zoom session opens and closes with a rotation of slides about today's program. These slides provide a short resource list and information about continuing education credit for clinicians. There's also a link to our center's website where you'll find short bios for our speakers and other program information. There's also a link to previous programs video recordings on our YouTube channel. This Medical Center Hour is being recorded and closed captioned and will be posted to YouTube within the week. Give and take between the audience and presenters is a Medical Center Hour hallmark. On Zoom, we ask that you enter your questions and comments into the Q&A function. We'll draw from your questions for our speaker's consideration after everyone has done their presentations toward the close of the hour. Your views do matter to us, so please do use the Q&A function. This Medical Center Hour, The Stigma of Clinician Burnout, Breaking Through the Culture of Silence, addresses a weighty and urgent topic at the heart of healthcare. As we'll hear, this panel presentation is born of loss, but provided we invest attention and effort, it can also betoken hope and constructive healing change. Even before the COVID pandemic's extraordinary stresses for frontline healthcare workers, doctors and nurses in this country were experiencing high rates of depression, anxiety, and PTSD and dying by suicide at an alarming rate. Burnout was rampant. But tragically, in late April 2020, healthcare worker burnout gained a name, a face, and a personal story with the death by suicide of Manhattan-based emergency medicine physician and COVID survivor, Dr. Lorna Breen. Dr. Breen's death has galvanized efforts to reduce stigmatization of health professionals' mental health needs. Starting with her family, but now sparking institutions to act, there are campaigns to change laws, calls to shatter the silence around burnout, calls for organizations and individual doctors and nurses to develop real strategies to address burnout's root causes, and in doing so, to reinvent healthcare culture for healthcare providers and patients. Our panel will speak to this work. First, Jennifer Breen Feist and Corey Feist, co-founders of the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation, will discuss the foundation's work, including on legal and legislative fronts. We'll then hear from UVA Dean of Nursing, Pam Cipriano, who together with the Feists wrote a compelling piece for the National Academy of Medicine that's essentially a call to action. And we'll turn to Dr. Bobby Shabra, Chair of Orthopedic Surgery and President of the University of Virginia Physicians Group for a look toward system and peer strategies and solutions. And then we'll turn to you for your ideas. Here's the challenge. Remembering Dr. Lorna Green, how can we start to transform our workplaces so they truly and sustainably care for the health and well being of those who provide care? Thanks to the UVA Physicians Group, the School of Nursing's Compassionate Care Initiative, and the Dr. Lorna Green Heroes Foundation for their help with this program. None of our panelists had any financial conflicts of interest to disclose. And we'll actually begin with a news clip uh, from New York City uh, earlier this year. Able to hold a dying patient's hand and afterward have to break the news to the families that their loved one has passed. This is a burden that can prove to be too much. News Force Gilma Avalos is in our newsroom with more on this. Gilma? 
David, according to a new survey out today, one of four physicians knows a doctor that has taken his or her own life. Experts say this was a public health crisis long before COVID-19, and the pandemic has only worked to heighten the issue. Now the family of a beloved Manhattan doctor who knows this loss firsthand is speaking about it to help us care for the healthcare heroes on the front lines. She had always wanted to be a physician. It was in her heart and in her soul. Dr. Lorna Breen answered her calling, becoming a top ER physician at New York Presbyterian in Manhattan. As the coronavirus tightened its grip on New York, Dr. Breen went into the trenches, treating COVID patients, contracting the virus herself, and then returning to the hospital to continue working around the clock. On April 26th, she took her own life. She had COVID, and I believe that it altered her brain. Dr. Breen's sister, Jennifer Feist, spoke exclusively with the Today Show then. Feist tells us Lorna had no prior mental health issues. I keep waiting to find out that there was some secret I didn't know about that would explain all of this. And the fact is, there isn't one. They learned only after her death of a significant risk factor. She was a doctor. This turned for her in a period of weeks, and she went from being fine to being gone. Doctors have the highest suicide rate of any profession. Last year, 400 physicians took their own lives. Dr. Gary Price is the president of the Physicians Foundation. Being a physician's always been stressful, uh, but the COVID epidemic has, has made taking care of patients even more difficult and, and sometimes impossible. A national survey released today reflects that, with nearly 60% of doctors expressing feelings of burnout compared to 40% before 2020. Feist, who created a foundation in Lorna's name, has teamed up with Dr. Price to help remove the stigma and give doctors and their families the tools they need to get help. They're calling for a culture shift. If the culture were that, um, perhaps she would have stayed home longer, perhaps she would have recuperated longer. I believe that she was sick. She went back too soon. And then what she saw was overwhelming. Right now, Congress is also considering a law in Dr. Breen's name that would help provide mental health support for professionals in the medical field. Helping care for our health care professionals, FICE's mission in honor of the woman who made caring for others her life's work. And if we can help one single family avoid going through what my family has gone through, this work will all be worth it. Hi, I'm Jennifer Feist. Uh, thank you so much for inviting us to talk with you all today. Uh, as you saw, I'm here today as the co-founder of the Dr. Lorna Breen Harris Foundation named after my sister Lorna. I came to this title because my sister died after a heroic battle, first with COVID, um, and also then as an emergency physician in Manhattan during the peak of COVID. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Lorna and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we're doing and um, other people that we're hearing from who are also having similar experiences to ours. One month before we lost my sister, she and I were in a hot tub in Big Sky, Montana discussing her 50th birthday, which was on October 9th of this year. And we were talking about the merits of an easy trip versus a further away trip um, and which would be easier and more fun. And here we are a few weeks after her birthday right now. And instead of uh, partying someplace like Miami or going someplace like Italy, we had a quiet brunch at our house with my mom and my sister Karen. And we opened condolence cards that were sent to Lorna's hospital at the Allen in New York. Lorna was the director of the emergency department at the Allen. She was double boarded in emergency and internal medicine, ironically, because she knew that uh, when she went into medicine, emergency medicine has a high burnout rate. She wanted a backup plan. Lorna was always our superstar. She was the daredevil, the hardest worker. Uh, she loved adventure and she always wanted to be an emergency physician. As was just covered in that news piece, uh, my sister contracted COVID in mid-March and uh, the whole time she was homesick, she was virtually attending meetings. She was trying to track down PPE for her colleagues and her department. She was texting me every day, the daily count of physicians, PAs and nurses who were out on quarantine. And I know that so many healthcare workers got sick and I'm sure continue to get sick. 
after she was sick for one week, her fever went away and she called the hospital and told them she could come back. And three days later, she was in the hospital. My sister told me during this time what she was seeing every day. She told me about a man who was found dead in his chair in the waiting room, oxygen tanks that were empty, a woman who waited four days to be admitted from the emergency department into the hospital. I heard about total chaos that I'm sure so many of our healthcare providers still are living through today. And I just heard this morning about peak number three. And so, uh, so many things that some people have yet to experience. But because my sister was a hard worker and a go-getter, I said what I thought I should say, which is New York is about to reach the peak. You can hang on. And I said, you can hold your breath if you have to. On April 9th, my sister called me. She was really struggling. She couldn't get out of her chair. Uh, as has been covered in the press many times, I was able to get her here to Charlottesville where, she, where we live. At the time, she hadn't slept in over a week. She was confused and she was speaking slowly. Uh, but there was one thing that she kept saying, which was that she was going to lose her job. She kept telling me something she had told me earlier in this experience, which was that she was struggling at work and everybody knew it. And now mind you, this is not a conversation we had had for months or years. This was a conversation we had had between the time she got sick in mid-March and between the time she called me on April 9th. After my sister got to Charlottesville and was admitted, she told me she was gonna lose her license and she was convinced that her career was over. And this is somebody who worked her entire life from the time she was a child to achieve her professional goals. My sister died by suicide on April 26, 2020. And I'm as confused today as I was in April about how this happened. Lorna had no known or suspected mental illness, no depression or anxiety. And I've said since the beginning that COVID affected her brain. But we're here today because what we learned after my sister's death is that her fears for her job, for her license, and frankly, even her concern for the respect of her colleagues were not off base. I talked in that news piece about how I keep waiting for somebody to tell me the double secret, which is what caused this. And we have come to believe the double secret is that she worked as a physician. Um, that was her secret. Stigma of mental health and seeking support begins before people get into medical school. It's reinforced as students adjust to the incredible workload. It's cemented during residency and then institutionalized by licensing and credentialing questions asked in many states. This is the case for physicians, PAs, nurses, many of our healthcare providers. This is a difficult and sometimes awkward conversation for people to have, but we believe this entire culture needs to change and our expectation that our healthcare providers be superhuman with no needs, no fears, and no need for rest has to change as well. So here we are almost six months after we lost my sister and Corey and I have been working on this foundation since nearly the day after she died. We've been inundated by emails and messages from people who've had experiences like ours or close calls. And I can tell you that I hear from somebody almost every day, more often it's multiple people each day. Here are just a few examples of the stories that we're hearing. I heard from a woman who said, my husband is a surgeon and was suicidal most of last year. He was catatonic and profoundly depressed. The stigma attached to his mental health illness was most, definitive, most definitely one of the reasons things got so bad. He was terrified of taking medication, getting interventional psych treatments, taking time off work for mental health. It almost broke us all from a physician in Kentucky. When it comes to mental health, our healthcare system is still literally in the dark ages when it comes to ignoring and fostering physician stress. We have a daughter about to embark on residency and I fear for her future unless significant reform can be brought about to end the stigma of mental health stress on physicians and healthcare providers. And from patients of a physician in California who died by suicide last month, our dearest friend died on September 26, 2020. 
He became severely depressed in March, we believe, as a result of the negative pressure of COVID. So here we are, Corey and I, as the founders of the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation to bring up the awkward conversation, to put it on the table and to shine a light on it because it is time for the burnout, anxiety, and stress to end. We can all do it together. Thank you for having both of us today. Um, I'm here wearing actually two hats for us. Um, first, as the CEO of the UVA Physicians Group, working arm in arm with Dr. Chabra and Pam Cipriano, almost on a daily basis. Um, as well as the co-founder of the Dr. Lorna Brain Heroes Foundation. As the CEO of the UVA Physicians Group, I can tell you that our overarching goal for the organization is to be the physician and provider employer of choice. And what we've learned along the way in, in learning more about this burnout issue is that 80% of the causes of burnout are related to organizational factors. So our healthcare institutions, organizations like UVA Health, UVA Physicians Group, play a crucial role in helping to mitigate the burnout. In addition, healthcare uh, institutions and physicians need to recognize that medicine has this highest rate of suicide than any other profession. It's, it's nearly twice the national average. Let that sink in for a moment. This profession, which is about healing people, is actually has the highest rate of suicide of any other profession. Why are we just thinking about and talking about this now? At the UVA Physicians Group, we have been working on addressing the institutional drivers of burnout for several years, and we've made some progress there. We've made progress in improving the electronic medical record satisfaction through a number of programs that we've got launched across the health system. We've made progress in, in improving our providers' sense of engagement, particularly where we have worked to redesign not only the electronic medical record, but roles and responsibilities around team care and many of our practices that surround Charlottesville. We have a lot of work ahead of us but we're committed as an organization to support both our physicians and our providers. Now, when Jennifer and I formed the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation, we began this tireless personal effort where my professional life and my personal life converged. And we, we worked, have been working tirelessly at national and even international levels to reduce the burnout of healthcare professionals and safeguard their well being and their job satisfaction. Jennifer and I envision a world where seeking mental health services is universally viewed as a strength for healthcare professionals rather than a weakness. Like Lorna, physicians and healthcare providers suffer from a critically high degree of burnout and stress. And as has already been stated, Prior to the pandemic, 400 physicians each year die by suicide. And now we have the COVID-19 pandemic, which has magnified this issue faced by all of our frontline healthcare providers. Yet as we have learned, and as many of you know, many folks continue to suffer in silence out of fear of the professional stigma of seeking help. In the majority of, the, of states, this fear is exacerbated by required disclosures to mental health assistance uh, for their mental health assistance, uh, whether to licensing boards or to cred credentialing or privileging forms that healthcare providers have to, have to complete for insurance or just to work in a hospital or healthcare institutions. In order to avoid professional repercussions, overly stressed and burnt out physicians and providers often feel trapped while they take care of patients and take care of their needs before those of the, of the healthcare provider, him or herself. This is no longer a healthcare industry problem. It is a problem that affects all of us. It is no surprise that when we've looked at the rates of medical errors 
that there is a 200% increase in medical errors when healthcare providers are burnt out. Now, as you may know, Lorna cared very deeply about her professional colleagues, as much as she cared about her patients. And as a way of extending her care for her colleagues, Jennifer and I co-founded this foundation. And we've focused on several areas with our goal of making a long-standing impact. The first area we focused on is in building awareness for the issues to reduce the stigma. We've spent hours upon hours in these chairs right here, touching now what has been counted at over 65 million Americans through media appearances, through uh, newspaper publications, through, through magazines, social media, and the like. We've published four national articles, including one we've co-authored with Pam Cipriano. We've spoken at numerous roundtables <clears throat> like we are here today to talk with you about. And importantly, we have partnered with dozens of organizations who are, who are all coming together with us to attack this issue and make it right. Lorna's story has been highlighted in over 70 publications. And for those of you in academic medicine, you'll recognize uh, the acronym, the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, they will be highlighting our work um, in their upcoming national conference in November. Within this body of work, as was noted in the news clipping, we have also worked at the, at the state and federal level on new laws to protect our healthcare workforce. Senator Tim Kaine introduced the Dr. Lorna Breen Healthcare Provider Protection Act in the Senate. It has now been introduced as well in the House both bills have bipartisan support and, has bro and broad support from across the healthcare community and the industry. The, the law is quite simple. It aims to do exactly what we're talking about today, reduce and prevent suicide, burnout, and the me mental and behavioral health conditions that, that impact our healthcare professionals. And it starts in their professional training and follows them all through their career. At the state level, we are partnering with a number of organizations to look at all 50 state laws and identify best practices in the questions that medical licensing bureaus and boards ask of their applicants. Again, we've developed a coalition under the banner Humans Before Heroes, and that campaign is an active um, in the active development phase. And we are literally meeting on a weekly basis to review the laws and to try to come up with what we believe are best practices. Finally, our work on the foundation will turn towards funding research and programs to reduce the healthcare professional burnout and improve provider well-being. This is an effort that we cannot do alone. We invite you to join us Follow us on social media. Go to drlornabreen.org for information about what we're doing. And join in this fight. This is a critical effort to preserve and protect our healthcare workforce. And we thank you so much for participating with us today and supporting all of these efforts. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jennifer and Corey, for all the work that you're doing. Um, I have joined this fight, if you will, about three and a half years ago through the National Academy of Medicine's Collaborative on Clinician Wellbeing and Resilience. It was realized quite a long time ago that burnout was really affecting the providers as well as the quality of patient care, as you've heard. And some of the statistics are alarming that, you know, Half of physicians have been reporting that they're burned out. They have a higher de uh, depression rate at almost 40%. This is true for trainees as well. Nurses have also been affected. 43% with high emotional exhaustion, 
And that's been a consistent number as well as at least a quarter of intensive care unit nurses reporting post-traumatic stress disorder. So what is burnout? Uh, you know, we've, we've talked about this uh, in, in many arenas for years, but I think what's been interesting is that we finally come to the understanding that it is a workplace syndrome. And because it, it has these elements of emotional exhaustion and depersonalization, it really is, that's what affects the ability or inability to provide quality care. And then the other more devastating emotional reaction is a, is a decreased sense of personal accomplishment from your work. So it's not a, an individual diagnosis, but it is dramatically affecting all of our physicians and nurses and pharmacists and therapists and PAs and the entire workforce. The National Academy group has, as you heard Corey say, really identified the, the characteristics that are driving uh, burnout. And most of them really come from arenas out that are in part of the workplace or the regulatory arena or situations in our environment. And we've seen those exacerbated certainly with the political unrest, with the social justice unrest. So many factors in addition to the loss of control in the clinical environment, to the stressors of in, inappropriate workflow and additional work requirements that have been added to everyone's roles in the, in the last decade have been contributing to the additional uh, burnout epidemic. I want to share just a little bit about nursing because again, the largest workforce has really studied and understood burnout and moral distress for many decades and has uh, tried to cope. But I think the collision of a number of forces and recognition that this has been a growing concern now has brought all the disciplines together. But what you might not know is nurses have expressed that their rate of stress at work is double that of the public. This was a survey of more than 10,000 nurses that responded and said, yes, when they go to work, they expect to have a higher degree of stress. There's also alarming statistics that, that almost a quarter of nurses have been physically assaulted at work and half being bullied. Now the American Association of Critical Care Nurses uh, 12 years ago put out their initial standards of healthy work environments, which is something we subscribe to and really know is part of the system solution to all of the issues that, that we're aware of. The, these are again, are not driven by personal inadequacies. The burnout epidemic is really being fueled by workplaces and changes in the work environment and the requirements and regulations that are making it un, untenable for people to be able to practice what the profession that they, that they went into initially. So these standards, again, we were not gonna go through them in detail, but recognizing again, how important communication is. You heard the mention of teamwork. That's in many respects, part of the solution set for how we can reduce burnout, but making sure that we have uh, recognition and strong leadership. Now, all of us know that the stress of COVID has affected everyone. So what you see on the slide here is not unique to nurses, but it has characterized the fact that over the last eight or nine months, we have had significant additional stress because of, of shortfalls of protective equipment. The death rate about six times that of what many nurses in particular had experienced, as well as the physician and other caregivers. The fear of bringing the disease home to loved ones, family members, parents, uh, others has been uh, un insurmountable. And then again, the rising anxiety, depression, insomnia, PTSD. So the American Nurses Association has been tracking and, and surveying nurses. So over 10,000 nurses responding to uh, survey this summer, the most alarming, again, results. How, do you, how have you experienced feelings in, in the past two weeks when they were surveyed? Over half said they were overwhelmed and close to that number said they were unable to relax, irritable or sad. Similarly, the biggest problem reported, 60% were having trouble sleeping or sleeping too much and then a range of other factors. What's most important again to recognize is that there's a shared responsibility to address burnout. First and foremost, it's shared between organizations and individuals. So many people say, well, if I could just make myself better, if I could be resilient, that would be the answer. That's not the answer. We need to come together 
with system solutions to make sure that the environments are meaningful, supportive, that people can provide the quality care that they are accustomed to. And at the same time, we help individuals to build their self-care practices, providing those tools and opportunities to learn, as well as support resilience. And there's many, many programs. And I'm gonna just um, highlight a couple of things that are part of our program at the University of Virginia, which has been embodied in the Be Wise approach. And you'll be hearing more about this program in, in two weeks at Medical Center Hour when Dr. Peggy Westfall and Dr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Peggy Pluzogan and Dr. Richard Westfall will give you a much more in-depth snapshot. But it's important that when we when we are well, we do better together. And so the Be Wise approach has takes three, three efforts. One is to provide the tools to help with resilience, but also to remove stressors and in a peer-to-peer -peer counseling environment to be able to recognize the impact of stress. So there are a variety of activities and training and support systems available in BeWise. You just see them listed here. But what's more important to know is right now, as people are experiencing the uptick in stress, not just because you may be in an area caring for COVID patients, but all of the assaults on our senses and emotions over the last nine months, everything from the uncertainty, the fear, the onslaught of patients, the, the fear of bringing disease home or getting sick yourself, the, the uh, injustice that we've seen and the social unrest that has, has come with the reckoning of, of racial injustices and also recognizing that we can, as we get closer and closer to the election, uh, emotions are high and that has been unique in the United States this year. But there are many resources, starting with the Compassionate Care Initiative at the School of Nursing, also through the School of Medicine's Mindfulness Center and the Contemplative Sciences Center at the university and the faculty and employee uh, program, assistance program, FEEP. So you see the many of the different offerings listed there on the right, a lot of mindfulness-based stress reduction and contemplative practices that you can learn for yourself. Again, recognizing it doesn't weigh on your shoulders alone. This is, this is something together with our organizations and together with our governments and other professional associations, we will, we will make significant inroads in making sure that we are stopping the epidemic of burnout. Thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Bobby Chauber. I'm the chair of orthopedics and the president of the physicians group. And it's a true honor to be a part of this panel. Uh, I want to uh, thank from the bottom of my heart, uh, Dean Cipriano's efforts and Corey and Jen Feist taking a personal tragedy and bringing to light a vo very important topic and, and crisis in healthcare uh, that has flown under the radar for way too long. Uh, I've been at the University of Virginia for my med school training, residency training, and now faculty for almost 20 years. Uh, I wear three hats uh, for the purpose of this discussion. I'm a busy clinician uh, every week, uh, seeing patients uh, at the hand center and then operating in our outpatient and main ORs. I'm a department chair for the last uh, eight years. And, and as a president of the physicians group over the last four, three years, I have seen um, what uh, burnout has done uh, to uh, our, our team members uh, but have also witnessed it across uh, several other institutions. Our goal as physicians, and I think everyone will agree with me, is to provide exceptional care to our patients. And in doing so, we don't, do not want to disappoint our patients. We do not want to disappoint our colleagues. We do not want to disappoint our chairs and, and the individuals we work with uh, as members of our uh, caregiving teams. It, but not wanting to disappoint has led to a cultural problem. Um, when we are struggling, we have no option or opportunity to discuss these struggles with individuals that we can trust. We, have, we live in a culture, and this is a healthcare culture, uh, that showing weakness or distress um, may be viewed negatively and could potentially be used uh, in a uh, detrimental way to an individual's career. 
this is a part of the culture we live in and it's a culture that needs to change. It has to change now. Uh, if we do not focus on the providers and we have been living in a time in healthcare where the, patient, the focus has been on patient engagement, the focus has been on improving quality, the focus has been on cost reductions, the focus has been on population health. But what about focusing on the providers and their work environment? One of the most frustrating uh, positions to be in is when you don't have control over your environment, you are trying to meet expectations of patients and, and the system that you work in, and then you are beginning to burn out. And burnout, as we've heard, leads to disengagement. It leads to uh, medical errors, and it leads to uh, people leaving medicine early. The, the, the US uh, uh, Health and Human Services reported a statistic that we will have a shortage of 90,000 physicians by 2025. And the biggest driver for that is burnout and people leaving practice. So unless we, unless we uh, address this situation immediately, uh, our crisis is gonna be even greater. And, and we are gonna be wanting to receive care as well. And we will not receive the care that we need in the future. It's not just for our patients. This is about ourselves and our care in the future as well. So having an environment that allows individuals to speak up when they have concerns or they are feeling pressure or they are struggling is necessary. And this culture is important to change. I fill out credentialing forms on a weekly basis. I review credentialing forms for the physicians group uh, across all departments. Um, there is a question there that says, has this individual had mental health problems? And credentialing can be held up um, because of this. We protect HIPAA for patients every day, but what about HIPAA for providers? How come there's no focus with protecting the providers that need care? And when they have to apply for uh, licensing through their state boards, they have to disclose this. And in many ways, determinations about a, a physician's or provider's employment can be made based on that information. And, and that's something that we can no longer accept. I was asked to speak uh, about um, what health systems or what we can do uh, to address this. And I want to first say that, you know, I have experienced burnout throughout my career. There have been periods of time where I've become very frustrated. And there's been periods of time where I felt like this is not the place for me anymore. Uh, maybe I should leave the institution. And the reality is, is that I didn't find until more recently ways to speak about this to my colleagues. And now that there is this issue has been brought to light, I think it will help us move forward. We are asked to provide a, a, a really an unbelievable level of care for our, uh, our patients and to teach and, and perform high level research and engage with our team members in a very difficult environment. There's obstacles everywhere. And these aren't just small speed bumps. These are brick walls that we're hitting frequently on a daily basis. And we are expected to do this without breaking down. And I think that expectation has to, has to stop. We need to support providers to help them become more resilient and to help them overcome these obstacles. And we are seeing the manifestation of people breaking down every day. Uh, we can only take so much as providers. We have professionalism issues across the health system. People act out, people retire early, uh, people are disengaged. You can see their performance fall off. I actually uh, created a vice chair for a clinician wellness position in my department and had our first MASLAC uh, survey done for uh, inventory done for burnout across the department, across all providers about six months ago. And I was shocked at how many of my orthopedic providers actually have experienced burnout and have reported feeling disengaged and have reported um, feeling like that they may want to quit working. And I have tried, have immediately started implementing uh, ways to help these providers and these individuals. And I'll be repeating that survey in the next few months to see if the work we're doing is having any impact. So from a, as a health system leader, executive, uh, in, in executive leadership, I would like to talk about a few of the things that we need to do. 
one, we need to change the culture that um, showing weakness, uh, showing any sort of uh, sign of uh, stress or talking about stress or talking about feeling work uh, burnt out is a, is a sign of weakness. This has to be um, addressed and modeled by our senior most faculty members and our leaders within the institution. We have to let our faculty and providers know that it's okay to talk about this topics. It's okay to be vulnerable and it is okay to express your vulnerability to the people that you work with and the people you work for. Because if you don't feel comfortable doing this, we will never change the culture. So some of the immediate things we need to do is we need to provide the mental health services needed for our physicians. We have to create an environment where uh, they are encouraged to speak up and, they, and we have to eliminate the feeling that they are letting their colleagues down, they're letting their patients down and letting their chairs down by being honest about their own mental health or their own struggles. We need to support uh, proactive mental health treatment for providers and safe havens so that their licensure and their credentialing is not impacted. We have to be truly HIPAA compliant for all our providers too, and not just for our patients. And we need to address burnout before it happens. We are in an environment where burnout, where we treat burnout after it's happened. We cannot, we have to change the paradigm now. We have to treat burnout before it happens and provide the support proactively. And, and that we can do together. And by having open conversations and showing that we're here to help each other is gonna be the first step. From a, from a more uh, uh, specific um, way to help is we have to improve the usability of the EMR. The EMR was designed for finances. It was not designed to make the provider's life better. And we know that and we are aware of that. So we need to make this about helping physicians and providers care for their patients, not about the finances of a health system. We need to reduce documentation requirements for providers. And we have to work with the government uh, and, and our payers to say that a lot of these documentation is unnecessary and unneeded in the care of a patient. We need to provide alternate platforms for providers so that they can use uh, Epic and their electronic medical record through all their devices to make it easier for them so that they can do it uh, during uh, outside of work in an easier fashion. But for the long term, we really need to develop executive level chief wellness officers at all health systems. Uh, and their, fo their singular focus is to study the environment, collaborate with providers, share data, disseminate strategies, implement strat strategies across their health system, but across all health systems, and learn from best practices on what we should do to best support our providers in healthcare. There should be dashboards and metrics like we follow in quality for uh, assessing burnout and, and assessing the, uh, the, uh, the, the um, usefulness of the strategies that we are implementing. Now, self-care and physician wellness are very important, but they need to also complement burnout initiatives. And the stakeholders are not just the providers. It's the, uh, the it's health insurance companies, the state and federal agencies, medical schools, residencies, EHR vendors, health systems, and board of medicines for different specialties. All of these teams have to come together to address this health crisis uh, within, uh, within medicine because working together is the only way we're going to reduce burnout and provide the strategies and the, the, uh, to, help, uh, all, uh, to help our team members deal with this as, as uh, if we want to be successful in, in medicine moving forward. Uh, the, my fear is that if we do not address this now and, and, and focus on burnout, a lot of talented people we are working with today, uh, we will not be working with in the near future because they will choose to do something else, or they will choose to retire from medicine early, uh, or they'll choose uh, career changes, which I am seeing already, even in my department. So um, I, uh, I hope uh, that we can continue this conversation. It's been an honor to be part of this panel. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Jennifer and Corey, for sharing your family tragedy and making the most of it. Thank you, Dean Cipriano, for the incredible work you've been doing in this area across the country for so many years. And I hope uh, that I can learn from the three of you and help in any way I can uh, in my role within the UVA health system and as a member of the physicians group.
Thank you all for your wonderful presentations, um, all from the heart, but also dependent on a lot of uh, research, older but also newer uh, studies that are, are documenting the extent um, and, the, and the nature um, uh, of, this, of this problem. Um, we have, um, so you all have contributed a lot. You're contributing more with the work you're doing. Um, we're gonna turn to our audience um, because I think these are <clears throat> at, at bottom are you know, more potential partners uh, for working in this, uh, in this area on the very different um, aspects that this problem has. We've been hearing from a number of people and um, the questions are pretty general um, and, and apply. Uh, to several of you if, if you'd like to answer. Um, I will mention that first of all, just as we started the presentations, um, there was a confirmation from our audience that indeed this is a problem, that if you come forward and say that you're struggling, um, people have a very hard time believing that they actually will not be punished uh, for this. Um, and that you know the other concern that they have is even if their problem is does have a, a way to be addressed, talked about, attended to, there are also risks with all of your colleagues knowing that you are struggling um, still within this um, this culture that until it all changes um, poses a number of risks. We also had a later question that had to do first of all with um, even if the culture is changing, some senior supervisors are very much of the old culture and, un and unwilling to hear uh, what is being asked and unwilling to do what uh, Dr. Shaber has done is ask his clinicians, you know, how are they doing? And, you know, got an answer that maybe he wasn't entirely wanting to hear, but is now beginning to act on because of what he heard. So what about this in this transitional period? How can we help um, when there is, you know, as, as, we, as was suggested, quite rampant burnout, but still some dangers in a culture that is beginning to acknowledge the problem, but hasn't yet implemented and institutionalized solutions. So who would like to take a shot at that? Well, let me let me start, and that is that I do believe we are uh, pretty far along on the journey at UVA in terms of now elevating what will what will transition from what people have known as just be wise to the wisdom and well being set of programs. This crosses the School of Medicine, School of Nursing, University Physicians Group, all the medical center, and it is a first major step to say we are together in recognizing that this is a critical issue and a systems problem. Now, people will, will have to take a risk. This has been a confidential service, uh, again, that has multiple arms of, of assistance, peer-to-peer -peer counseling, the ability to step forward and say, I need help. If an individual is not comfortable within their own area, Again, the, the, this is a, a place to go for confidential help. Just as during when COVID popped up, uh, the Department of Psychiatry stepped up to, to provide confidential telecounseling. So I believe that, that we have made some major steps forward and are embracing this as an organization. Uh, so very soon, we're gonna be doing a, a survey that has been spearheaded by the American Medical Association called Coping with COVID. So that's gonna tell us about our entire workforce, give us some more information. There are other supports like the Moral Distress Consult Service that is available to help people if they are having individual issues or a team that is having issues in order to be able to assure that they can do the right thing, which is a major step to prevent burnout. So I think we've got, we, we are on the way to really helping recognize that as a system we have to change as we heard you know, Bobby speak very strongly, it is a cultural issue and it relies on really strong leadership. And so I applaud Bobby's efforts because if you don't know the scope of the problem, you may not be able to address it. So I think that's where we are continuing to focus our efforts now is to say, we do need a cascade of leaders acknowledging and, and holding up 
a change in culture so that people will feel safe and be able to speak up. And I agree with you, Pam, that um, the, the uh, leaders here at the health system have recognized this and we uh, now need to figure out the best strategy to move forward. And this is gonna take input from our team members and they have to be comfortable and willing to speak up. Um, you know, I, I've, I understand we have a lot of old guard here. I consider myself old guard when it comes to the way I teach surgery. And, but there are things that I've had to change so I could better connect with my uh, residents and fellows and my young faculty members. And I've had to change the way I do things. Otherwise, I was not being the best educator that I'm capable of being. I can't teach the way I used to teach 10 years ago because the paradigm of education has shifted. We need to accept that the old guard, as you said, when it comes to understanding the stress that our uh, learners and um, uh, faculty members and team members experience across the health system with regard to burnout and, uh, and uh, disengagement and, and stress that they experience. We have to realize that the old way that we've done things is no longer acceptable because it has incredibly negative consequences for patient care and for the future of, our, uh, of the way we provide care across all health systems in this country. So uh, we all have to change and we all have to be open to conversations and we have to remove the stigma uh, and we have to support those individuals who are willing to take the risk and speak up. And we need to applaud them for speaking up about their issues because it will only allow us to develop a system that's better than what we have today. So uh, another set of questions has to do with um, sort of the on the ground working conditions for health professionals. People have cited the challenges of um, in a unit where uh, someone has, or more than one person has been given time off to address um, problems that needed addressing and, and are feeling quite supported in that. And yet this leaves the unit perhaps short staffed or unable to completely cover the work that's there without unduly um, tasking others uh, in, the, in the service to, um, to step up. The other issue is that in lean times and the expectation is the times will remain financially lean uh, for the foreseeable future in healthcare. So what happens if we're going to be developing new programs, offering new um, initiatives for wellness and resilience and things on a a personal level and instituting um, systemic changes. Um, how can we do all of that when um, when some people are going to be saying it's it's too expensive financially, or are we going to be skimping on some of the essentials of of patient care in order to sustain our staff? So, what are your thoughts about that balancing act? anyone. All right, so, so I have to speak up. <laughs> there, there's never a reason to, to say something's too expensive if it, when it's the right thing to do. There may be some trade-offs, but I think there, and, and if we say we're evidence-based, clearly there, there is the personal cost that we know is accompanied with burnout. Uh, and, and again, the, the ultimate uh, endpoint being suicide, which we should be wanting to prevent at all costs, but also recognizing this is a serious concern for patients. It's a serious concern for our trainees. It's a serious concern for us as a system to be able to say, yes, in fact, we do take care of our caregivers. This has been recognized nationally, internationally, again, exacerbated by recognizing not just the immediate mental health concerns that have been brought in by the pandemic, but the long-term scars and aftermath that, that we'll, we'll continue to see. So I really, again, I have to go back to the fact that this is a leadership issue. This is one where we have to be able to make the commitment to say that the resources are necessary. And if there are other trade-offs, you know, that, then, then that's a, a decision that needs to be made. 
But if you're not investing in your people, you're, you're also not investing in, in the outcomes for your patients. So um, thank you, Dean Cipriano. So, you know, I do think we are in a very uh, challenging time moving forward. We are, uh, resources will be limited because of the impact of COVID uh, for a period of time. How long that is we, we, remains to be seen. Um, we've had financial mitigation, staff furloughs over the last several months, and, th and that has increased stress in the entire work environment. We are, uh, we are trying to build up our staffing numbers in the medical center across inpatient and outpatient because we, our patient volumes are starting to increase. So a lot more of the burden uh, falls on the providers uh, when uh, our staff members uh, are furloughed or, or not there, or we are understaffed. So this is going to be a big challenge, but uh, as we, as every, anyone who's worked in any health system knows that there's, a, there's waste in with, within any health system, and we need to figure out where we have to be lean um, because there is waste and may not be necessary as we move forward in a new uh, uh, world order uh, based on this pandemic and, and how we provide healthcare for the future. We have to see where we need to be lean and we need to see where we need to provide support uh, when it comes to patient care. Uh, and as Dean Cipriano said, if it, it, money should not be in the discussion if we're talking about doing the right thing for our patients and our providers and our team members. So there is money in the system. It's just not being directed to the right place. And, and I can tell you that, that that's true across every health system. And we need to take a deep dive to see what we're spending money on within a health system and see if we actually need certain programs, see if we need certain initiatives, and maybe we need to focus on other areas that are uh, more important to focus on because the consequences of not focusing on them will be very dire for the future. So um, let me turn to uh, Jennifer and Corey um, with a question that looks forward. Um, we have some questions about, you know, individual agency on the part of, of health professionals, both from the sense that simply being asked about or talked to about burnout may not be helpful if in fact you don't feel you have yourself any power to do anything to change the situation, or uh, that the system that you're operating, you know, that you're working in, is not amenable to helping you make those kinds of changes. And looking forward, thinking about, and and the two of you as as peripheral to medical and nursing education, let me ask you your thoughts about. How what might change in the education and training of new doctors and new nurses to confer a, a sense of agency on this to help them understand that, you know, just becoming personally resilient may not be the best equipment for working in an inhumane system. And so how do we equip these young health professionals to move into a system and help to make and be part of the change? Yeah, these are great questions. Uh, and I, I can start and then pass it to Corey. But um, the very first thing we started on with this uh, work was awareness. Because I never in a million years would have put myself in this position as the survivor of a physician who died by suicide, never in a million years. And um, when my sister died, I said, people need to know how quickly this can happen. And um, obviously your career is important, your license is important, but your life is the most important. And so I talk to anybody who will listen um, I do believe that the culture needs to change, and I believe it can start happening uh, with people in the education level, um, and there will be change that happens. So, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that people need to feel like they have to out themselves to a community. Your mental health is your own business and nobody else's, um, but 
you know, people need to know that this is serious and it can happen quickly. And I believe that the awareness is a huge step in that regard. There's, I would just add two things in the interest of time. Um, first is uh, when you need to, when, when you're looking at this change and at really at a systemic level, there's often much more that you can actually do and control than you think. And so starting with what, what you can control um, at a medical school level, one of the things that, it, that um, is related to that, that that occurs to me is if 80% of these factors that drive burnout are institutional in nature, um, you know, one would quickly go to, well, that's a lot of that is electronic medical record. Well, but there are a lot of a, a lot of medical students, and I would assume nursing students, who also fall victim to suicide and burnout. And so it's got to be something different in those in those educational um, hallways, if you will, that's creating this these issues for those students. So I think we I think that the educational itself needs to take a hard look at itself and say, what is it about the trappings of medical school, nursing school that create in and of, you know, um, distinguished from the institutional factors they get into practice. What is it in that? Um, and how can individuals take ownership of it and talk about it? As Jennifer and I have, have said multiple times, we will talk to anyone who will listen because this is not a conversation about being tough. This is not a, uh, you know, the tough woman or tough man contest. Our sister, her sister was the strongest, uh, toughest person I've ever met. Um, I, you see that same kind of thing with these, these, uh, the, the, the soldiers who go off to battle and they, and they're super tough and they come back completely burnt out. There's something else here. This isn't about being tough. This is about, frankly, in many cases, being vulnerable and being willing to have conversations peer to peer, peer support kind of networks. So I think that in the, in the educational framework, folks need to take a look at those systems as well as take ownership and say, what are the things that we can do and we can control just to change the conversation and support each other? That in and of itself will go a very long way. Good, thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going to have to close, but I hope that this hour has given our audience a lot to think about, a lot to think about acting on, uh, on peer-to-peer -peer levels, on individual levels, on institutional levels. Um, and uh, we urge you also to um, get involved with the uh, Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation. Acquaint yourself with the work they're doing. Um, ally yourselves at your own institutions with the work that is underway there. We invite you to come back to Medical Center Hour next week, the 28th of October, for a program on a slightly different kind of healthcare reform, but perhaps it would make some changes that are consistent with what we've talked about today. We have Dr. Vivian Lee with us from Health Platforms Verily in Boston, Massachusetts. She's author of a new book called The Long Fix, Rethinking the Remaking of U.S. Healthcare. Just an ambitious program just ahead of an election that's often all about healthcare too. We thank all of our panelists for today. We've had many comments commending you for your remarks and your activities and, and activism uh, today, as well as questions. So thank you and um, be well and we'll see you all next week.